but I'm not there for their salvation. You know, only the Holy Spirit can change them. All right, and welcome to another episode of the End League Podcast. My name is Josh, and we are really excited for tonight because we are doing our anime roundtable. We're actually be having a second group tomorrow night, so this will be the next two weeks of our podcast. So part one and part two. Um, again, we'll be having <clears throat> a different set of people on. But again, we're going to get through our first roundtable. And we have some guests that we have had on the show before, so it's going to be great to reconnect with them and have them share their shows and topics that they're going to share tonight and we'll be sharing our topic and show as well so without further ado let me bring in my lovely wife rebecca hey guys good and, to be here yeah uh, as you as you are every week every week yeah i mean you don't you really don't have a choice unless okay. you're sick or something well I, I there has been like a couple of occasions where you have almost not appeared there the... have been, yeah, emo- times of emotional distress or <laughs> whatever is going on. But I pull through, and I always feel better when we talk about all of this stuff. So that's good. Right. That's right. At the last second, so I'm go. Okay, I'm gonna do it. So I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for those of you who have been following the podcast, we did this actually last year. So we had a completely different set that we we're still using Zoom, which feels like a million years ago. <laughs> From what we're using now, a um, whole lot better um, with just the layout, and we're really happy with it. But I don't want to belabor the moment too much. I want to bring in our guests tonight, so I'll bring them one by one. We have the first author, M. H. L. Rick, with us. Hello. And then we also have another author. Oh, okay. All of our guests are authors tonight. Mia Say, how are you? Good to be back. And Ian Chaffin. Hi! (laughs) Ladies, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It is always a pleasure to have you on. I like you. Yeah. (laughs) I'm glad. (laughs) And, uh, and, okay, yeah, I'm so sorry that I say, is it Sai or Say? I can never remember. Sai. It's okay. It's just, my names have always just been spelled (laughs) in. Awesome. Well, we're going to kick things off, and um, Elizabeth, uh, you're going to talk tonight about Spy Family, correct? Oh, uh, no, actually. Oh, no, no. Who? That was a previous episode. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. I, who, who was... Go listen to it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, who was, who was, okay. Uh, okay. It might well, be tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, probably will. <laughs> um, okay, Elizabeth, what will you be talking about tonight? Uh, the love of God and his forgiveness in Avatar yes, the Airbender. That's right. Yeah. All right. So for those who, for whatever reason, may have not seen Avatar the Last Airbender, can you give us a little bit of a synopsis? Uh, it's the best American anime ever. Like, go watch it now. No. <laughs> It's uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. He, you know, this young kid, 12 years old, has the weight of the world on his shoulders. And he has to save the entire world. But, like every good protagonist, he has all of his friends and even some enemies turn friends to help him save the world. And there's no magic in the world, but there is stuff like bending. So any kind of water bending where you can move water. Fire bending, air bending, earth bending. It's all around spectacular. I love it. <laughs> so out of all of the characters, which one would you say is your favorite out of the whole bunch? And you cannot say Aim. All of them. <laughs> all. Oh no. If I had to choose one, I like Sokka just because he's funny. Um, if I was ever in like in an actual like show, I wouldn't be the main character. I would be the funny sidekick. So mm-hmm. I resonate with him. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, he's pretty great. I, I do like Sokka a lot. Um, he's so quirky and fun. <laughs> All right. Well, you have the floor. Um, go ahead with um, the Travel Last Air Thunder. All right. 
so this idea of you know the love of god and his forgiveness in avatar the last day of render actually came to me when i was watching you short um <laughs> which is the most random place to get ideas by the way this person they just had the scene where zuko is asking forgiveness from Iroh. And I've just realized that it might be a little spoilers. I don't know. But anyways, he's asking forgiveness from his uncle Iroh. And he's like, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I just did all this wrong stuff. Please forgive me. And then in an instant, Iroh turns around and he just grabs Sokka. And, oh, not Sokka. Sorry. Zuko. He grabs Zuko in a hug. And Zuko's like, but you're supposed to be mad at me and yell at me. And Iroh's like, no. I love you, you know, I, I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed, but I'm not mad at you. I've always loved you. So, and in that instance, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's kind of like the parable of um, the, uh, the son who just leaves home and, you know, the prodigal son and he's just away and, you know, he's doing everything his dad doesn't want him to do. And then he realizes, wait, I've been stupid. I need to go back to my dad because at least with him, you know, I can be treated a little bit better than just a pig feeder. And he goes home and he's he's probably like thinking about how to apologize and how to beg for forgiveness. And without a word, his dad just runs to him and hugs him and loves him and says, I've been waiting for you. And of course, that parable alludes to how God the Father wants us. Like he's waiting for us to turn back to him. Um, and it's one of Jesus's best parables, I think, if, you know, you would want to rate his parables, but, but yeah, so just, and if you go into a broader sense of like how Zuko and Iroh's relationship is throughout it all, it's just throughout the series, you know, Zuko is so angry at the world and at himself and he wants to make everything right, but make it right his way. And then he learns that his way is the wrong way that his way is just buried under years of just hurt and pain and, you know, family issues, which I know a lot of us have to deal with. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you just see him at one point in the series turn and, and grow into this really good character, this really good man. It's one of the best enemies turned friends in a series that I've ever seen. Um, and that's saying a lot too. And, you know, just at the end, that that's when it sparks. It's like Zuko is his own prodigal son and seeing him with his uncle Iroh, who's just always been there to support him, not necessarily the Fire Nation, but to support himself. He, it just, I don't know. It's just, it's so exciting to see this in something that they probably didn't even think about Christian aspects. It's, it just showed up there. So it's really neat to see in this series that's just so beautiful. And it took the world by storm, or at least America by storm. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, I, I remember that scene and I instantly thought of the uh, prodigal son. Um, that's, that's actually one of my favorite uh, parables that Jesus tells. Um, it, yeah, it's just wonderful. Um, now, it's also great to see, and I think you may have mentioned this, how Zuko just has this heart transformation mm -hmm. um, during the last part of the series. I think it's like uh, book three. Um, and yeah, it's a lot of emotional parts, a lot of funny parts, and it's, it's really good. Yeah, just seeing... Like, it's him realizing, oh, I don't have to be like my dad. Or I don't have to be like everyone else around me. I can just go for the truth and not for what everyone has always said around me is true. It's him breaking those, those, like, just those chains of the earthly world around him and being like, wait, I need to go for truth. Not for my truth, not for my dad's truth, but for the truth. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, that I love that. I love Avatar, The Last Airbender. I love the redemption arc with Zuko um, because it's not just like he 
get saved and everything's sandy, you know, handy dandy. It's like, and he has to earn his place back. You know, he has to earn his trust back with the rest of the team with Aang and all of them, because they're like, you've been our enemy this entire time. And now we have to learn to trust you and forgive you for all that you've done wrong. Um, and I think, Oh goodness, waterbender gal, what's her name? Struggles Katara. the most. Katara, yeah. Katara, thank you. Struggles the most with that mm -hmm. because it's like you went and almost destroyed my entire nation. So, you know, that's such a fascinating thing with forgiveness and redemption. And I feel like Avatar the Last Airbender does a great job of putting that together in a story. I definitely agree. Yeah. And I I just thought of something too when you were uh saying all that. It's you know, usually when the bad guy turns into a good guy, they're like, oh, now you can uh, sacrifice yourself. Yeah, because we don't know how to deal with the aftermath of that. Like, do they just randomly accept you or do they go like, I hate your guts for five seasons, you know? But how Avatar does it with Zuko is so beautiful. Um, and it's just it just shows people and it shows kids watching. Like, you you might not have the best of times when you, you know, turn a new leaf but at least you're doing it. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. yeah, there's reconciliation at the end of the tunnel. You know, there will be people who do accept you when you, you know, you turn around. Some won't, um, but some will. And yeah, I love that you mentioned uh, Katara, um, Marie, because, you know, she did. She had a really hard time. And, you know, it reminds me even too of her, her story arc and how, um, with her mother's killer, I think. And, um, Oh yeah, that was oh, tense. Right. So <laughs> tough. Um, but Zuko was able to really help her through all of that. And I think that's, if I remember right. That's kind of what really broke the ice with them and brought them together. Right. Mm -hmm. Which by the way, totally shipped them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're like, no, not Aang and her. <laughs> yeah, it seems forced. I don't know. <laughs> It's funny because I never saw Avatar until like two years ago. Um, so I like don't have the nostalgia factor, but this is like exactly why like I found Zuko and I were the most interesting and they were like the only ones I cared about. Like, you know, I don't care about these other NPCs over here, like just focus on them. <laughs> just like that character development is just like top tier. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um and I know that next uh, Netflix is going to be coming out with, I don't know if it's another live action or that's actually animated for Avatar The Last Airbender. They've teased a little bit, which showed us nothing. Um, but um, there's, well, there's been a couple photos out I there. I thought it was live action, kind of like they did with One oh, okay. Piece. Uh, with, oh, yeah. Okay. Have any of you seen the One Piece live? Yes, action? it was actually phenomenal. Like oh, I thought really? it was going to be stupid, but like I was like blown away. I mean, like the pacing's a little weird because they had to like condense. So they're not going to do like a thousand episodes of live action. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like just top tier casting and like not cheesy. Like I thought it was going to be. Oh, nice. 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 Well, they did it. So what's weird about them remaking it, the live action is they did do a live action of Avatar The Last Airbender. Yeah. And that one did not turn out well. No. Yeah. <laughs> but then I heard rumors that they're going to develop the one when they're adults, kind of like the in-between that one in The Legend oh, of Korra, yeah. which I think would be really cool. Like, I would love to see that when they're like adults or teenagers or something like that. Animation. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. That would be really great. Um, but I don't know if they're actually going to do it or not because there's always rumors about stuff happening and then it never happens until it does. <laughs> it's very true. All right. Um, Marie, we'll have you go next. And okay. I know which one you're doing. You're doing Bungo Stray Dogs. Yeah. So I decided to do Bungo Stray Dogs um, with the theme of light and darkness. I feel like that's very prominent, not just in Bungo Stray Dogs, but in a lot of different anime. Um, so, but in particular, I was thinking with Bungo Stray Dogs, how it was in there. Uh, do you want me to give like a summary first and then talk uh, about how it ties into the theme or? Yes. So um, just to preface, um, the, the rest of this, you'll give a summary and then you'll go into your topic. Okay, awesome. I'll do that. So 
in a nutshell, Bungo Stray Dogs is about the main character at Sushi, who becomes basically an agent for a government organization that kind of works between the law and the underground mafia to help and or stop supernatural beings. And it's made up of supernatural beings. So at Sushi, you discover is actually what's called a were tiger, which is like he turns into part tiger, part man, and uses his powers to defeat evil or um, even help out good wherever is needed. As the series continues, it gets more and more complex. Recently, we they have had a new season that I've been keeping up with. And I don't want to give too many spoilers, but essentially there comes out another big bad villain, I guess you could say. And the turnaround is very interesting on that one. Um, what I really love about the show is that I found out all the characters are actually named after authors. And it took me three seasons to figure that out. I know that sounds silly. <laughs> or was it two? But basically, when the American super agency thing showed up, I realized, wait a minute, these are all American authors. I wonder if Atsushi and the others in the Bungo Stray Dogs agency or, you know, will, are they actually named after Japanese authors? And I did some research and found out they were all named after Japanese authors, every single one, including the underground mafia, which is uh, the like dark side of the Japan area. So it was fascinating. I was like, wow, someone did a lot of research to come up with their names to match them with the correct characters and then have their powers also somewhat related to what their um, author is. So the, whoever wrote the manga for this series and the anime itself like did a wonderful job of putting those two things together just on itself as a story. But how it relates to light and dark, specifically, I know that there's a lot of Japan, well, Japanese influenced by China, yin yang philosophy, especially in anime, that is not necessarily a biblical philosophy. So I thought that it would be good to read from John 1, because in John 1, it really talks about this. It says, um, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then like later on, it even clarifies that even more about how Jesus is the light and those who are of the light follow him and those are of the darkness follow the dark. But in Japanese philosophy, and you can see this very much in Bungo Stray Dogs and other animes, they have this dichotomy of light and dark working together for the greater good. So Atsushi actually partners with one of the characters who is from the underground mafia, and he is uh, Octagawa is who he partners with. And when he partners with Octagawa, their powers combined make them more powerful and they work as a team. And it's really interesting because Atsushi is very like white, like very clear that he has white hair. He wears white as a being. And then um, Octagawa is all black, all black with white skin. And so when they combine into powers, it's very much like showing that yin yang philosophy of black and white. And so I find it very fascinating that Japanese have that philosophy because it was influenced from China. And in this case, it's like they almost believe that these people working together for a greater good, it doesn't matter at that point whether there's good or evil, which I love the show, but it's like they have this weird gray in between. And that's across the board for many, many anime like Soul Eater, Bleach. Um, even we were talking about Naruto earlier, you know, you have a little bit of that. So it, it, I find it really interesting to look at their philosophy and see what, what are you trying to get at with this idea that there's always an in-between agency working, you know, not quite the good, but not quite evil for the betterment of society, you know, um, 
But as Christians, it's like, okay, can we accept some of that or can we not? Because like God tells us to be the light and not allow any of the darkness inside. So I, that's why I wanted to talk about that and see what you guys thought about that theme of light and darkness in anime, uh, your thoughts on Bungo Stray Dogs, et cetera. Yeah, it, you know, it really makes me think of um, something I've been learning a lot about recently for my school stuff. Um, and that is empathy. And I was actually reading a book earlier today for one of my classes that um, is called Gracism. And it's an incredible book. Have any of you read it by any chance? No. Yeah. So highly recommend. Um, but it's this, the, the guy who wrote it, he's a black pastor and um, he, his church, um, looks at he they focus a lot on like multicultural um family of god and um just how to love people and i just really loved how how he talks about how to love people um but one of the sections in there was all about empathy and how how do we love people i wish i could remember the quote that was just super impactful because it was basically like do we throw out what um, what we believe is wrong and what we see in scripture is wrong. We throw it all out. We're talking about like throwing them out of the axe. And um, say, for instance, like people of the LGBTQ plus community, um, we just throw them all out because we don't agree with them or, um, or take any group that way. Pro-life, pro-choice, pro-whatever, you know, that you agree or don't agree with. Um, do we throw out those individuals um, for the sake of, I don't know, truth, I guess, um, while neglecting the individual? And um, he's like, you know, you can come in with empathy and you can feel those feelings with the people and connect in that way, even though you may or may not agree with whatever it is that they're going through. I just thought it was a really cool representation. I'm not doing it as much justice as, <laughs> as it did in the book, but um, but it was really good. So that, that's what it reminded me of, the, the light and the dark and um, the sort of gray area. Um, and I don't think that's a gray area, but I mean, it, it kind of could be, I guess, and from a certain perspective. Um, so yeah. Well, and with Atsushi, He's a very noble person and he's clearly like a very good person and he is willing to empathize even with his hated enemy and work with him so that he can save more people, you know, and do right by what they need. And so I think that is very important that even when you're seeing someone who's not a good person, and yet still being able to understand where they're coming from and how they feel because they both were essentially mentored by the same person. Um, Dazai, one of the other main characters, also fan favorites by those who love Bungo Stray Dogs. And they were both mentored by him. And so he understands that. He understands what it's like to feel like you're alone and then find that one person who makes you feel like you're a part of something better. And so that's how he's able to relate to him. And he even tells Octagawa, like, uh, I will fight you as long as you promise not to kill anyone in the next six months. And Octagawa actually abides by that promise and refuses to kill someone for six months so that he can fight Atsushi. And so it's like they almost have their own honor system and own understanding, even though they're on the opposite sides of the tracks. So it's fascinating that warring between light and dark and what is inside their souls about that. Yeah, light and dark. Uh, that's a, gosh, we could, uh, tons of anime. I feel every adventure of sci-fi fantasy um, has um, some element of that. Um, can't think of anything right now, but <laughs> um, trust me on that. Um, but yeah, uh, Marie, what you were saying with uh, there is there is a balance between light and dark. Um, 
and Ginger faints so too. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we're called to be the light, the salt of the earth. So how do we as Christians, you know, balance that? Do we completely just uh, like pull away from the world and, you know, live in the mountains and, you know, just read the Bible 24 cents? No, no, no. We're, we're called to be in, you know, community with people. Mm -hmm. And while that is sometimes people who have not seen the light, who are not Christians, we're called to minister to them, to, to bring forth more light and to kind mm -hmm. of, uh, counteract that darkness so the light gets brighter and the darkness gets smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not about balance, which a lot of anime and has that idea of that, mm -hmm. you know, the Star Wars idea that there needs to be a balance in the force between mm -hmm. good and evil. And they have that same idea in anime, which I find hilarious, you know, like uh, there needs to be a balance between good and evil in these epic fantasy stuff. No, there doesn't need to be a balance. <laughs> um, we will ultimately want light to overcome darkness. We want evil to be eliminated. I think everyone wants suffering to stop, to pain yeah. to go away. Right. And um, they, we don't want a balance of pain and goodness. <laughs> like That sounds a terrible idea. <laughs> um, but it's fascinating to look at what, how they think and where they're coming from because we want to understand them like you were saying rebecca and just like knowing how they think so that we can we can empathize and at least relate to them on a human level even if we don't agree necessarily on a philosophy level absolutely it kind of reminds me of um you know when when jesus was here he went with the thieves he went with the tax collectors and all of them and he hung out with them and ate food with them and you know the pharisees were like whoa you can't do that no and he's like yeah if you do it right because he you know he didn't do what they did he actually told a lot of them actually all of them to hey don't sin anymore you're forgiven sin no more um but he he never since he was like he never allowed darkness to overtake him and so it's kind of like, like you said, Elric, like not have that balance, pushing it in the light's favor and doing that with such love and kindness. Because in all honesty, I think when you're super kind to someone who expects you to be really mean to them, it flabbergasts them. And they're like, wait, what? I, you know, <laughs> I've had so many atheist friends that go like, you're a Christian? I'm like, yeah. Because, you know, they've had bad relations with Christians or maybe someone rubbed them the wrong way who said they were a Christian. And then, you know, I just try to be nice and love them and all that. I don't know if I'm as good as Jesus. I don't think so. But, you know, it just, it just shocks them. It's like, wow. So it's like shocking the bad out of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And that goes back to, you know, loving your enemies, mm -hmm. doing good to those who hate you. And being willing to forgive when they come to you and say, I have done wrong, like we were talking about earlier. So, you know, it starts small, but then over time it can build into something greater. Um, so I just, I love that, how complex all the characters are in Bungo Stray Dogs and how they're all trying to make a better place to live in for those around them. And they don't always see like what the way is to do it, but they are struggling to find that way. And we've we've watched season one. Um, and we made it through. Do we make it through season two, Becca, or did? Uh, we either made it halfway through or almost all the way through okay. in season two. All right. Yeah, we need to we need to put that put that back up again. Yeah, it, it gets, I'll say this, it gets more intense <laughs> as you watch. So um, I felt like when you're starting out season one and even season two are kind of like, okay, let's get to know the characters. Here's a couple missions they go on, get to know their powers, stuff like that. And then, okay, now we're going to thrust them in the middle of impossible situations with terrible circumstances and see what happens. And uh, I saw a comment on the latest season that it's like, do you remember when Bungo Stray Dogs used to be more of a happier anime? <laughs> because it was that one to begin with. 
And then as it increased in intensity, it's like, whoa, okay, we're going to keep what that just happened. Um, so I think why many people love it is just there's a character for everyone, I guess you could say, because there's a wide cast, there's probably someone that you will relate to and be able to care about among the cast. And so that's why I feel like a lot of people love it is it's not just one person. It's like multiple, even though Atsushi is the main character, there's others that you grow to care about as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we're really, <clears throat> I mean, so you want to pick it up even more. Gosh, more intense. I'm not sure they can handle much um, <laughs> after the trauma of the, um, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Oh, um, Full Metal Alchemist? Yeah. They're, oh, yeah. Yeah. We still haven't finished uh, that. Yeah. Because it's intense. Kind of afraid to go back. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better. So, <laughs> well, that, let's oh, say. Isn't oh, that almost right. every anime, though? <laughs> like, it's yeah. like, oh, so nice. Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> It just gets more intense, and then you're just like, you let out a breath of relief when you finally get to the end. You're like, all right, I think everyone's safe. I think we're okay. <laughs> it's true. I haven't seen any of it, so I don't know. But um, it's been on my watch list like forever, so uh, I have to which keep one? an eye out for these themes. Um, Bogo Street Dogs. Oh, yeah. Which one, uh, for the theme of Darkness and Light, what do you think like would be an anime that you would think of? Uh -huh. nothing comes to mind like off the top of my head but like it's like you said like it is just kind of like a i feel like somewhat ingrained in like kind of all anime in general um yeah i mean the one i'll be talking about kind of has some of it in that now that i think right. about it but well, with that, let's get <laughs> on to your, let's get on to Mia's uh, selection, and that is um, actually something that we haven't really talked about on the podcast. It's it is an anime, but it's in the form of a video game, and that video game is Persona Five. So, take it away. Yeah, I was gonna say like it's technically a game, but they did make an anime series of it, even though it's not good, but it counts <laughs> for this. Um, but yeah, I am just absolutely obsessed with Persona 5, and, um, you know, it's always so difficult trying to give a synopsis of the game while also doing it justice, because <laughs> it's just, like, such a complex concept. Um, but, like, I promise it's amazing, even if I totally butchered it, but <laughs> um, basically it's about this group of teenagers known as the Phantom Thieves, who um, they're all social outcasts in their own unique ways. Um, and they come upon this other world, the Metaverse, um, which is basically like collective unconscious. Like it's really like psychology based. It's like um, just the cognition of different people, just kind of like incarnate, taking form of like a physical building or location. Um, so they gain powers and they fight these enemies in order to change the hearts of real life criminals, or steal the hearts as they call it. Um, and in the game's context, like it totally makes sense that they do this forcefully without the consent of these abusive villains because um, it causes pe it causes them to confess their crimes and turn themselves in. Um, but later on, it becomes this whole issue of the public questioning whether these methods are just or not. Um, and I've just always found the whole thing to be a fascinating concept. So um, for my theme, um, it's a little unconventional, but <laughs> I've chosen the fact that we can't force people to be Christians because like violently stealing hearts, it's not genuine. Um, like, you know, when the bad guys confessed and showed remorse all of a sudden, like it was just so out of character and people were like, you know, like they need psyche valves. Like the Phantom Thieves obviously threatened them and put them up to this against the will. Like, this isn't genuine. This isn't who they actually are. Um, and so just the idea that like, um, I don't know, just this the thing that, you know, church culture like pushes on us. Like you have to always evangelize, always like make people come to Jesus. And it's like, it gets really toxic real easily. Um, like you can't medic metaphorically go into the metaverse and steal someone's heart to make them follow Jesus. Like changes of hearts are God's job, not ours, and he doesn't do it that way, like forcefully and without consent. Um, I'm 
Like, I don't know about you guys, but I am always hearing heartbreaking stories about like how people were just viciously forced by their families to go to church and like act a certain way and um, you know, just meet strict popular church culture standards, even though they never wanted to, and they grew up to just hate Christianity because of it and often have a lot of trauma. Like, like I just don't understand how anyone could think it's a good idea to try to force or manipulate someone into something so precious as a relationship with God. Um, I mean, often it's about appearances for a lot of people, I guess, but it's like there has to be an actual willing heart before someone's open to receiving the gospel. Um, and the difference between the phantom thieves and God is that God doesn't force or coerce people into loving him. Um, like, you know, he invites people and has the door open, but he doesn't go into a meadow loose and fight them and drag them kicking and screaming into being with them. Yeah, I... In I didn't say anything. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely get that. Um, growing up, I know I said this a lot. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, I, I felt that a lot. Now again, always grew up in a Christian home, um, so I was instilled with these values from a very young age. But in that particular denomination, it was always forced of like, um. You know, everybody, you know, um, I, I didn't see you, you know, really praising God during worship. You know, you, you need to praise him more. It's like, I mean, again, as you said, I mean, that's really like just it's making a natural type of relationship more so a counterfeit relationship is not does, uh, on the outside. You have all the aspects. You're praising. You're worshiping. You're praying. You're going to service. But if your heart isn't in it, then it doesn't really matter. Um, you are no more a car. Uh, a car. If you spend the time, all your time in the garage, then you are a Christian. If you just sit your butt down every Sunday in the church service, um, it's. Oh, okay. I saw the shadow, and I'm like, "What is that?" <laughs> um, but uh, thank you. I, I, I've noticed that there is a lot of stories of the like religious trauma coming out, um, and it's because of exactly this: people being forced into a relationship where they they may have not been ready, they they weren't willing, um, they didn't have that willing heart. Um, now. They, or, or, have you seen any of this in your experience? Because um, I know you were in the hyper charismatic movement for a bit. More so as an adult. Because mm -hmm. um, I grew up in Baptist church and I don't know, it's just the thing. You go to church and even if it was just hanging out, you still go. Um but I, di I didn't really see a lot of that in the like hyper charismatic time uh, when I was there, mostly because I don't know, everyone is very emotionally heightened. Um, so it didn't feel like anyone felt forced to be there. Um, how about e either you? Um... Maria, listen, have they, either of you experienced um, yourselves or other people um, kind of uh, people forcing people to Jesus instead of the naturally come to Jesus? I know when I was younger, like my, it wasn't going to church that my mom was forcing me to do. It was wearing a dress to church. Uh, <laughs> I went through that phase of like, I don't like dresses. <laughs> and so, you know, there was that. But for me, it wasn't really forced to go to church, forced to believe. It was, how do I help others come to Christ? And it's just something I've worked through recently of, you know, reminding myself, I'm not the one that saves them. God is. I just need to be there, be loving, show like Christ through my actions and all that. And God's going to help me with all that. So I don't even have to do that alone. But I'm not there for their salvation. You know, only the Holy Spirit can change them. And right. so that's 
I think I was putting in some people might do this if they think, oh, I have to save this person, you know, kind of like the other side of it, not being forced to believe, but forced to save others. Yeah. You, that mentality, it's like you put so much pressure on yourself and then you're like, ugh, ugh, I can't save people, but you're not supposed to. God is. Your job is to just, you know, plant and uh, plant the seed and water the seed, not to make it grow. So. Yeah, I think, um, so I've been learning a lot about cultures recently and examining my own culture. Um, I don't know about y'all's culture, but uh, growing up here in the United States in a um, a white Anglo-American home, um, with most of the people around me, we have a very individualistic culture. And that's actually not the culture of the Bible. Um, you know, the Israeli culture is very collectivistic. And so it's like this idea of a family, a group coming together. And um, I think they would have understood that in the early church. And it it gets a little distorted now when we're in our individualistic society where it's like, I don't know, you're like a salesperson in a way, like you have a certain quota that you need to meet or else you're not a good Christian. And it's like, it, it reflects poorly on you and then you're not good enough. And then you have this, um, you know, I'm not good enough guilt and shame. And it's, it's a whole thing. It's really not great. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, so I, I hear what you're saying, Elizabeth, it, it definitely is, um, is difficult and, and it is, it's a, it's a group effort. We are called to live our lives, to love people, show empathy, and that can be really hard to wrestle with in this culture that we, we live in today. Yeah. I was going to say that when at my old church, there was a lot of emphasis on evangelism to the point of almost insanity. I feel like, like there was, I literally had one youth pastor go up and say, working in children's ministry is pointless. All of you should be become missionaries on the mission field. All the jobs that are you do are just for sending money to the missions. And he said that, and I was so upset because at the time I was working with children, I was in the children's ministry. And like he said, basically working for the children's ministry is just so for the parents to basically, he implied that all we were doing was babysitting children instead of ministering and discipling children. Um, and there were a lot of issues. He was later let go of the church, probably for other reasons. But when I heard that, I was just... I was stunned. I was appalled, really. Um, and luckily, I had enough of my parents and people in my family and God himself interfering and saying, no, that's not true. That's not what God says. Reading his word really made a difference because it talks about whatever you do, do unto the Lord, not unto men. So it's like, obviously, God cares about your careers and what you do and whatever those might be. And you don't just have to be a missionary to be a good Christian. If anything, we should be in other places besides out in the middle of, you know, some foreign country um, ministering to people. But it was amazing to me. Um, the corruption, I guess uh, you could say of God's word or twisting of God's word to make it pressure. Like you said that we have to make some kind of quota. Otherwise we won't make it to heaven. Um, I remember even them saying some example, like when you get to heaven, who's going to be waiting there for you if you don't minister to anyone, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, wow, OK. Um, but now, you know, it's fascinating. And Elizabeth can relate to this is as a teacher, um, I recently went to a funeral of a very good Christian man who taught in the public school for like 30 years and impacted students for a long time. I went to his funeral and literally they could not fit all the people that came to his funeral in the sanctuary or like we were in the overflow flow building and I had arrived 30 minutes early. And it was crazy insane to think about how many men and women and 
other people that this man impacted just by being a teacher and just by discipling and being there for kids and helping them and listening to them. And I thought to myself, and this is the same person, you know, I'm pretty sure it's the same person who said all these things that was like, oh, you won't have anyone in heaven waiting for you if you don't evangelize. It's like, well, clearly as a teacher, you know, you have an impact on your students and they will like, obviously after the death, they were able to be there for him and clearly were changed and moved by what he was, what he had done. Um, so it's just a good reminder. I think there's a lot of emphasis on evangelism, but not enough emphasis on discipleship and mm -hmm. trying to build people up who are Christians and trying to help them be equipped to serve God in whatever way that God has called them to do, whether that's a job or going in the mission field. So, you know, it. I've seen a lot of corruption. I've experienced some of it myself. But through it all, I think God has just reminded me, it's me that you're in a relationship with. It's not the church. It's not people. Um, you are, you know, and it's important to have faith in in God and not in other people. I mean, I know that sounds weird, but like we are supposed to love people and be in community, but they're flawed individuals and they can make mistakes. Um, but it's important to hold on to our faith. But I was going to ask you, though, for Persona, you know, you said they come under fire for basically dragging these villains, making them confess their sins and then purifying their souls. Do they come to a con conclusion somehow about whether this is just or unjust what they're doing? So, yeah. I feel like I would just be like spoil spoiling the whole game. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Tell me the answer. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because it's like on one hand, like, you know, what they're doing is helpful because like these people don't continue doing these awful things and like abusing children and stuff. Like it's, you know, it's a good thing. But at the same time, it's like, it's not like genuine, like repentance. Like when they have the exchange, they just like basically become just piles of mushes on the ground, just sobbing like, oh, I'm terrible. I should just go die. Like, um, just it's the whole thing um it's kind of funny like this is a little unrelated but um a pillow that stuck out to me in the game is like how at first like as the phantom things will become known by the public um you know they're being praised and reviewed and highly respected and all these people in town were like posting requests for their help and dealing with toxic and dangerous people in their lives um like the whole deal but then um, the whole justice thing starts when a famous detective starts trash talking them and calling them unjust. And um, it, snows, it snowballs into the public just hating them and wanting them gone. Um, and it just kind of reminded me of like the switch in attitudes towards Jesus from like, you know, people eagerly welcome, welcoming him into town as he's riding in on a donkey. And, you know, they desperately want him to make their problems go away. But then like 10 minutes later, they hate him and want him crucified. Um, it's like, as I play the game, it's like, you know, it's like, I can see the arguments, but it's like, I can just feel the frustration on behalf of the Phantom Thieves. Like, come on, guys, we're helping you. <laughs> like, we're stopping these evil, terrible people. Um, and just like that whole idea is like, just the smallest, most faded reflection of what I can't even imagine Jesus felt. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I relate to you a lot with like, the evangelism pressure, like from multiple college ministries I was in it was just so there was so much pressure to yeah like go overseas like what are you even doing if you're not going overseas you're being disobedient um and also like because our college like had like a lot of like international students so it's also like oh well like the nations are coming to you so like you need to evangelize to them like make disciples meaning teach people how to evangelize and like this whole thing and like something I'm still just like unlearning with the help of my mentor is it's like you can just just be a good friend to people <laughs> like just be kind don't try to like manipulate every conversation into something you know christian related um but it's um it's just kind of interesting the whole like spectrum of ways people can just be traumatized by that like whether it's upbringing or you know interactions with the church um you know there's there's a whole twist in the game with the final bosses that I don't want to spoil, but like an idea that I've noticed that the Persona series as a whole promotes is the dangers of people not thinking for themselves anymore and just kind of going with the flow and wanting everyone, or wanting someone else to solve all their problems. Um, and like, that's the thing that happens too, kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum is like, 
you know, even if people didn't get angrily Bible thumped in, into submission by the parents and it was just something they did and didn't question, like a lot of times they'll still like go up and still walk away from it because they realize they don't care and they didn't actually believe in it in the first place. Um, I think that's just like a reflection of how unhealthy and toxic it can be to force blind faith onto people and not make room for asking questions or just like being so dismissive and simplistic about everything. Like, you know, we don't do that because we're Christians. End of story. Um, it's like whether it's family on blue friend, whoever, like it's just so important to have actual respectful discussions and not create an environment of fear and intimidation. Um, like there has to be legitimate like desire to know God and not just obligation. Um, and if it isn't, like, you know, I'm of the belief that love honors freedom and we have to respect when people are that. Like, you know, there's a character Futaba in the game who she, like actually wanted a change of heart and she sought out the Phantom Thieves for it and um, eventually became one. Like just like so much trauma that she had from just a lot of messed up stuff um, from corrupt adults. Um, and she was just like, you know, hallucinating and hearing voices, like all this stuff because of like, you know, basically like she thought it was her fault, her mom supposedly committed suicide. It's the whole thing. Um, but like, that was like just a completely different scenario than like all these people who are like we're just gonna do this in secret and like force you into submission kind of thing or um Saini Juba who's like the interrogator of the game who like keeps like doing flashbacks to like you know once the protagonist like gets arrested basically um she has to question him but like her heart gets changed like not because of like stealing her heart in the metaverse even though they do try to do that like it's through like conversation and listening um yeah, I just yeah. think, what's that? You, oh, I was going to say, when you were speaking about them giving a new heart, it kind of reminded me how it says in scripture that like, I will give you a new heart. And mm -hmm. I think that makes a difference, right? Is it God or man trying to force the person to have a new heart? If it's man, it's going to fail. If it's God, yeah. it will succeed. And, you know, like God's the one that gives you a new heart. He's the one that draws you to him. And he, it's ultimate his by his power that we are changed so it's fascinating that the persona game kind of tackles that subject but almost as a what if mankind had the ability to change hearts what would happen you know yeah and, and how that power could be used in an evil way to force people oh, yeah there's a whole thing with that too like yeah somebody causing mental shutdowns in there like it's it's a whole thing yeah yeah that's, that's so interesting it's kind of like you know, when man tries to do God's job, they completely fail. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I keep thinking about this, like, um, it's been all over the news, um, you know, AI being like the new religion and they creating like its own God, its own Jesus, its own Bible. Um, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's artificial. It's going to be counterfeit. Um, so that, that kind of makes me think about as well. Yeah, there's a lot of counterfeits out there. And I think that the more we have of the world and the more we're exposed to it, the more we're going to have to be discerning as Christians. And the only way to be discerning as Christians between what is true and what is false is to read his word and have a relationship with him that's personal and not just like forced on you by other people yes. or other things. Mm -hmm. And so I and that's also where discipleship comes in like actual discipleship, not just going and like converting people and then leaving them in the middle of a desert, you know, to figure it out on their own, like actually mentoring people and helping people and coming alongside people. That's going to make a difference. Not just like, you know, massive. Oh, we came to Jesus. All right. Good luck guys. Like <laughs> A lot of people <laughs> think it's like a magic, magic switch. It's like you said, right. It's like, okay. All right. I'll turn that song. Yeah. It's, it's like, <clears throat> It's like you go to a new job and you expect to be trained, um, and they say, "Okay, well, here here's a manual. Go ahead and read it, and by the end of today, you should be able to do everything on that manual." I have so many traumatic stories of those kinds of situations. Me too. I have <laughs> like, one job, right? like I got there, and like nobody was there for like the first three weeks except for maintenance guys, <laughs> and like. Just figure it out. And like a week later, like, how are you still so sucky at this job? <laughs> and 
Oh man, that's exactly, but Josh, that's, you're right. That's exactly what we do to new Christians. Like if we don't follow up with them and we don't disciple them, we essentially say, all right, here's a Bible, go figure it out for yourself. Like <laughs> go do the job somehow. Yeah. yeah. I remember um, there was years ago, I ended up meeting a mutual friend of someone um, we met for the first time and I was just like telling him about my life story and what was going on and what God was doing in my life. Um, I had no idea if this guy was a Christian or not. I was just like talking, sharing my experience. And um, at some point it came out that he had really been questioning. He wasn't a Christian and um, he was questioning and God had just like, he orchestrated that moment to to for me to just come in and share my life story and this guy was ready and i was like oh okay let's let's do this um and so he accepted christ and it was amazing but i just remember following up with him uh, occasionally and um i i think i either gave him a bible or he already had one or something. I don't, I don't remember what it was, but I remember him asking me specifically, he was like, so I'm noticing when I'm looking through, there's like books and then there's chapters, but then there's like little numbers in between. Like what, what is that? And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like he didn't even know how the Bible was like broken up into chapters and verses and things. And so I taught him how to read that, but, um, but yeah, it's it's so important to to really sometimes go basic, basic, um, where people people don't know a lot of the stories. Right. And like recommending to them, you know, with a genuine acceptance of faith, that was something that they wanted, you know, nothing forced, but to kind of give them guidance, like, OK, maybe start with this book of the Bible and then like get them plugged in with the group or church or whatever. And I think about when I was in my old church, I actually did lead someone to Christ because, again, you know, the pressure to lead someone to Christ. And I wonder sometimes about her because I never followed up and it haunts me to this day. But I was a kid, you know, and my church, again, emphasized evangelize, evangelize, convert these people. They didn't tell me, oh, what do you do once they said they're saved? Like, you, like you said, Becca, like teaching them, oh, this is the this is a chapter and these are the books and mm. you know this is what the Bible is about. Maybe you should start here and like mm. or doing a Bible study with them. Like, mm. God, you know, we weren't taught that, and I wish it was more taught. Not just like yeah. you get yeah. saved, but this is how what happens when someone does get come to Christ because God worked through you and what you do to follow up with that person. And telling them not to read Leviticus until they're ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like don't, don't read it yet. Okay. Just start with like Mark or Luke. Right. Or Gospels. Mm -hmm. The Gospels. Start there. Yeah. Start there. yeah. Like you're at a baby Christian level. Yeah. Let's work up to the meat. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It reminds me of um, uh, an episode of an audio drama that I used to listen to, and it was this. Um, man looking for like the best way to live his life and a person offers him a bible it's like it's god's word you can't go wrong so he doesn't read it in order he just reads it like just um i think the narrator said and so he woke up and read the first few chapters of i fell upon um <laughs> and he reads a chapter it's like um you know god wants those who bear good fruit and so he opens up the fruit stand and he sells um these different produce and then and like you walk the next morning it's like no one shall eat fruit from you again and so it goes back it's like what do you mean you don't want that business i just sold the other day i said i want to sell it to you but i can't <laughs> and just he goes back um to this person after like these failed attempts at different things and he's like, I can, I, I, this book is full of contradictions. I can't see how they, anybody can live by it. But again, you have to read it all, just not select verses. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I think this is all kind of like reflected in the game too, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like just the contrast between um, like the criminals who just, you know, go to prison, um, 
just sad for that kind of thing. Like nobody follows up with them. Like they don't get counseling or anything. And you kind of see them at the end of the game and they're just like defeated in mind and soul. <laughs> um, but then you have like Futaba um, who like, you know, she like joins the group. It's like, it's a whole found family other than they, um, you know, they like continue to help <laughs> through like all the trauma and everything. It's not just like, oh, yay, like, you're a phantom thief now, and everything's good. Like, there's just a lot of follow-up with, with, like, all the characters, too. Um, like, I don't know how far you got in the game, Josh, but, like, um, Futaba and Yusuke are my absolute favorites, and they're both totally autistic, <laughs> like, I'm calling it, and I think that's why I feel a level of kinship with them. Um, cause, like, I think that's actually, like, good representation in the media, a little side note, but, like, they're just so lovable and wholesome, and, like, they're just part of this main group of heroes and contribute their gifts and talents and you know it's just like the others like we just get to watch them living their lives and growing as people um and so it's just yeah it makes all the difference like actually having people by your side to walk through stuff with as opposed to like good luck <laughs> um and yeah it's interesting how like just like it's i feel like i'm talking a lot about like oh like other people but like the game i think just really like has a lot of meaning for like your own faith too um there's like the way that one becomes a phantom thief and gains powers in the first place is by making the decision to break free from the oppression of society and corrupt adults and all the expectations for how they should live and act and um but then choosing their own path and um just like discovering their true selves um and someone pointed this out to me the other day how um you know like contrary to what a lot of people think um, like we don't lose autonomy as followers of Jesus. We actually gain it in living and making decisions that are in line with our true selves and who we want to be. And, like that was totally my experience when I became a Christian. Like it was like discovering my true self little by little. Um, but like, you know, for both my myself and the Phantom Thieves, it was a willing choice that we made because we wanted to. Yeah, it's interesting that you were talking about that because as weird as it sounds, have you guys seen Romantic Killer on Netflix? Yes, yeah. and uh, yeah. I know we'll actually be talking about that with one of our guests tomorrow. <gasps> oh, that would be so fun. But not to spoil too much, but there's a certain baddie that at the end basically gets their memory erased to make them not bad anymore. But it's like it doesn't really solve the problem. And there's like hints that there might be more issues later on. And so it's fascinating because you were talking about that. Like basically if someone is just converted or changed and then they don't get that help, like you're, that one character you're saying who actually did get help and you saw her like building up her confidence over time, that like makes a world of difference. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it reminded me of was Romantic Killer. So I guess that just means I'm going to have to watch uh, part two of the round table at another time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Becca, do you think we should talk about our pick? I think tonight? we should save it for tomorrow. Cause tomorrow. I think we okay. had, um, we had someone who was going to be joining us tomorrow. But oh they, yeah. Yeah. So not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that'll work out. All right. Awesome. So you have to tune in for the second yep. one to see what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Becca, I will tell you this: uh, we both, uh, Becca and I, both enjoyed the series. It's a short one, twelve episodes. Um, yeah, so, so we'll there... be talking about um, my happy marriage. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. it's really it's, so yeah, it's got, it's got a lot of intense parts, a lot of good parts. And, yeah. Okay, that means we'll get to make notes too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We, we didn't make any notes. Yeah, no. so, well. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Again, it was so much fun. I think we'll end by having each of you tell us what you're currently watching, playing, listening to, reading, what have you. And we will go in reverse order this time. So we will start with Mia. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm so late to the party on this one, but I'm slowly watching um Yu Yu Hakusho um <laughs> sorry that's my favorite anime of all time yeah. <laughs> and like it's funny because like I'm usually just like sub only ride or die with a couple exceptions 
Blue Dab, Kusona actually being one of them. But um, so like I started watching Yu Yu Hakusho in sub um, and I was just kind of like, eh, it's just okay. But then my friend was like, no, like the dub's better, trust me. I'm just like, <laughs> that's probably just through nostalgia talking. And she's like, no, it's better. So I, I switched like 20 episodes in. I'm just like, this is better. <laughs> like, we're like getting into it more now, slowly. I usually just watch like a couple episodes a week or so. Um, I'm on the dog tournament season now. Um, but yeah, so that's been good. I originally wanted to because it's the same creator as Hunter x Hunter, and that was mm. one of my favorites at one point. Um, and then I am playing Tears of the Kingdom, and I've been kind of like destroying myself, staying up irresponsibly late, just <laughs> grinding. I feel like a little kid, but I've I've, I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just like so much like exploration. There's like different layers. Like there's the sky, and then the land, and then underground, and that's been my hyper fixation as of late. Nice. I know I got to finish Breath of the Wild before I can even get to the Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah, Kingdom. it's like it's like that, but on steroids as far as like time commitment goes. Oh I've spent so much time already, so woo. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, all right, so Marie. No, Elizabeth, sorry. No, it was, oh, it was Marie. Marie. Oh, Marie, Marie, Marie sorry, yeah. Marie. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I watch anime, a lot of anime actually, because my husband got into it. So now we're like watching five different shows. So I'm just going to focus on the one that I'm only personally watching because he'll watch stuff without me and I'll watch some things and then we watch some things together. Um, so right now, and we we're just talking about that Becca, but I'm watching Naruto ship it in for the first time. Um, I got into it and then now I'm like, oh, I'm really hooked. I really like this, which at first I didn't think I would. And then the more you get into it, the better it gets. Mm -hmm. so for those who were like me and watched like two episodes and were like, no, I don't know if I could do this. Just hold on, hold on, hang in there and it gets better. Um, <laughs> as far as reading goes, I am reading Sigils of the Giver by K. Michelle Mosley. Um, shout out to her. She's a great author and hers is actually kind of about like cults and almost it, it's not, it's fantasy. So it's not Christian ish, but it's like almost like what happens in Christian cults to characters, I guess. And then like them getting freedom from it. So um, obviously we know that cults aren't really from Christ, but it's like that influence in it. So highly recommend if you're someone who's trying to heal from church trauma, I feel like this book would be good for you. Um, and then I'm currently working on, so if I'm going to do like writing in there, um, I'm working on the third book in my series. It's in my editor's hands and hopefully will come out in May next year. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited about it. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and May. Hopefully, prayerfully, I will have enough time to do all that work. But my editor is very excited about it. She loves a lot of what I've already done. So I'm hoping to smooth over the rough edges and be ready by May of next year with it. So that's it for me, though. All right, Elizabeth. Uh, Elric, I'm so excited for the third book in your series. <laughs> Same. I read the first year. I'm like, oh! <gasps> There's a third. I want to get to both of the books eventually. I just have such a big backlog right now. I totally get it. Uh, as for me, with school, I haven't been able to like read or or watch a lot of things, but audiobooks does help. I've been reading this series. It's called The Ranger's Apprentice. Um, it is beautiful. It's the best thing ever if you want like healthy male relationships and you know like male and male relationships, male and female, you know, not romantic, but just healthy relationships all the way around with really funny scenes. I love it. I just got like, just getting done with the last one in the series, the Emperor Nihonja, which is a play on Japan. So fictional Japan is pretty cool. And the first one is Ruins of Gorlong. If anyone wants to actually read it and make me happy. <laughs> Um, besides that, I have slowly been making my way through One Piece. I'm at Dress Rosa when that is the best book. Oh my yeah, gosh. <laughs> I'm like I've heard of like all the stuff that's coming, and I'm like I'm I'm at Dress Rosa. Uh, I have so many feelings. We'll need to discuss this later. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will. 
Um, and then uh, project wise, Avarice, I was going to get like, try to get out last year. And then God's like, nope, you're going to wait. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, but I'm actually like getting close to, to publishing it. It's, it's going through editing and all that. And it's way better than it was last year. So I'm so glad God made me wait. Um, and then after that, I, if, unless God has a different idea, it's like the third book in the series. So, so Avarice is the second book and I'd probably be working on the third after it. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I know we talked about kind of like what we've been watching last week. Um, we're still continuing the Lynn saga. Um, we finished uh, My Happy Marriage. That we'll be talking about tomorrow night. For those of you listening, it will be next week. And um, personally, I played a game kind of like Persona 5, or it wanted to be Persona 5, which is called Eater Nights. Um, e T E R N I G H T S, um, and you develop uh, relationships uh, with these different characters. You're trying to save the world from uh, zombies or infected people um, from this like um, disease that's like rid all of um, Japan, or I think it was just contained to that part of the that part of the world, and gosh it really plays with your emotions um because at the end uh, not to spoil it for you but there is a um there's a sacrificial love and it can play out many different ways um but you got you one has to go and you don't want the one that you've been putting most of your time in to go but unfortunately that that, that happens um Beck and I have both been listening to a true crime podcast called Scamanda. The story is wild. Just how this woman had like conned um, charity organizations, a, a church, friends and family, strangers. If you like, yeah. if you like crime dramas or whatever, it's very interesting because it, it's this lady who. Um, she says that she has cancer but as you find out as you go through the story maybe she does maybe she doesn't and it's fascinating uh highly recommend if if you're into those kind of things <laughs> and becky you then uh listen to a couple different audiobooks or uh, one? one series in particular <laughs> uh it's the throne of glass series have you guys read it or heard of it no Heard about it. I've heard of it. Heard about yeah. it. Never read it. So my my sister was actually the one who told me about it. I was going on a long drive recently, and I was like, okay, I need a book. I need a book that I can listen to. And it was like an eight hour drive, and I listened to the almost the entire first book of the series. Um, but it was really really good. Highly recommend. It's this assassin who um, she had. The first book is all about. She has to um compete in this competition to become the king's champion but there's other nefarious things going on behind the scenes and there's like there used to be magic in the land but it's been something has happened to the magic and it was like sealed away or whatever and um so you, you go on this journey of of what what is really going on behind the scenes um and it is very good <laughs> All right. Well, I heard they listen. You have your suggestions. So we definitely encourage you to check those out. Again, thank you once again to all of our guests for being with us for uh, Roundtable Special number one. And we will be back with you all next week for part two. Until next time, keep those halos shiny and stay holy, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>